Hello. Hello and welcome everyone. <laughs> so glad to have you here with our live demo series with Art Toolkit. And today I'm just thrilled to be joined by artist Jill Ritchie. Yay, there you are, Jill. Hi. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Oh, and, and um, Jill, I'll just share a little introduction. Um, you're an Alaskan artist, and remind us where you're based and how cold it is there now. <laughs> I live in Fairbanks, Alaska, and it's negative 40 this morning, so I hope nobody was expecting a plain air demonstration, because <laughs> not today. And you mentioned it's so cold that you aren't in your studio, but you're at your kitchen table where it's much warmer. <laughs> I am, yeah. I'm sure you guys can uh, relate to the home studio and... Being closer to the wood stove is certainly a pleasure on a day like today. Oh my goodness. And I love that all of you watching live um, are popping into the chat and letting us know where you're calling in from, from Yukon, Canada, Cape Cod, New York, Fullerton, California, South Dakota, Montana, Missouri, England. Oh my goodness. Southeast Florida, North Carolina. We're just so glad to have you all here with us. And um, Jill, it's really a treat to talk with you, and I'll just share a little with everyone how we first met, which was at your bachelorette party when you got married about seven years ago. Yeah, rock yeah. bachelorette party with painting. <laughs> yeah, you had reached out to me and you were like, hey, I really want to get together and paint. And we just spent the most delightful time together. Like, I remember sketching at Essential Bakery in Seattle, and then we went to Gasworks Park and sat out overlooking Lake Union painting together. And I just, it was such a, a warm and enthusiastic and really joyous, joyous time to be together. And I've really loved following your work over the years. You've got an archaeology background and you've been um, developing your art, your, your practice as an artist, um, just creating beautiful work from your backyard to the backcountry. And um, I know I've been really inspired seeing what you've been creating, and I'm really thrilled to have you here um, to, to share your approach to, to watercolor with Art Toolkit. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, now that I think about it, we probably should have done some like figure drawing or something for that bachelorette party, but <laughs> <laughs> for, for anyone else thinking about it. Um, but it was great. I actually was in Seattle um, this fall and took a run down to the waterfront out at Gasworks Park and was reminded of the scenes there and <laughs> painting for that first time with you and, and some of my girlfriends. So fond memories as well. And um, I'm long been inspired by your work as both an artist and then making, you know, the tools that you have that allow the rest of us to create as well. Um, and some of your overlap with with science and art. And I really relate to that as an archaeologist and sort of I think of myself as being trained in observation because that's what a lot of my field work in archaeology is about, but it's also, um, I think, an essential skill for artists too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's my, my, that sort of keystone for me also is observation and thinking about art as this practice of attention mm -hmm. and that tool. And I mean, um, I do love engaging with science through art and helping tell science stories. And it's all about you know, yeah, practicing noticing things around us and asking questions. And um, I love how art really invites the um, those opportunities to to sit down and take time. Um, well, maybe you could share a little bit of um, some of your, your approach to watercolor and the tools you've got um, to share with us today. And I can pull up your desktop too. Okay, yeah, maybe we'll do that. And then you'll be able to see a little better. So I still am a tried and true fan of the original kit that you uh, introduced me to, you know, seven years ago. Oh, you have an early, early one. It is an original. <laughs> that was when it was just me in my studio and I had like my cupboard of art toolkit supplies. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, it's been run over by cars. It's got paint stains, all of it, but it's it's simple and it can go in a purse, a backpack, anything, you know, it, it can go wherever I go. And I have a bigger set, but I find that this is the one that I use 99% of the time. I love how over the years, at least some of my old ones get like a little stretched out from how I constantly overstuff them. And so they just feel like <laughs> it's kind of like a wallet that fits in your jeans pocket or something and absolutely it, it needs yeah. all the right tools in it. <laughs> so what do you have? <laughs> so I keep, I have the big, bigger palette. Is this the folio? Mm -hmm. Um, 
that I got a couple years ago after it was run over by a car. Um, I can't and remember you reaching out about that. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, kit was fine. The palette got a little squished. Um, but yeah, this is this is the palette that I use on a daily basis um, if I if I can. Uh, and I mix up the colors with seasons and with trips. I just came back from a trip to Japan and I didn't do as much painting as I had hoped um, because of life, but I definitely expanded my palette a bit from what I normally would use winter in Alaska. I typically don't need a lot of, you know, greens in January up here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, my daughter uses it as well, despite my best efforts to uh, bring along her own kit in a teeny form, um, she still prefers, you know, the wider variety, which I can understand, but I'm, I'm trying to have her, um, share supplies, but also have a little bit of her own too. So I'll be working from this palette today during our demo. Um, and then in the kit, yeah, I just have a, a sketchbook. It's the uh, old Stillman and Burn, And this is also a shared, <laughs> <laughs> oh, those are the best. Then you get to look back and have those memories. And you mentioned your daughter's four. Yeah. So sometimes I get a page to myself. This was in Hawaii earlier this month. And uh, sometimes they get shared. Um, in the winter up here, I do like to sketch with alcohol that doesn't freeze. Um, so I can still plain air sketch. But I also rely sometimes on, on just plain pen or or pencil drawings um, when when paint isn't quite what my fingers are up for. Do you use straight um, alcohol or do a mix of it with water for your water brushes or what's your approach It there? depends on the temperature for me. Um, when it's really cold, I'll use straight alcohol, preferably something I can drink if it all goes poorly, but um, mostly, you know, a gin or vodka, something like that. And then I'll mm -hmm. mix it when it's a little bit warmer because the issue with, <clears throat> with alcohol is that it dries so quickly yeah, um, and just, you know, it evaporates right off the page. And so it can be really hard to get blends um, and things like that, that I'm yeah. more used to with water. So I'll, I'll dilute it when I can, but as you can see, this is quite a collaborative effort. Oh, I, love it. <laughs> um, I didn't pull out one of the, you know, one of the more, I don't know, accomplished sketchbooks. But anyway, it's, it's fun to share. And it's also a good reminder, you know, to be around kids who are always experimenting with creativity in their own ways and not afraid to mix colors you'd never think to mix or get messy. And um, I need a little bit of that reminder in my life. So mm, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, thanks for the peek there. Beautiful. Yeah. And then just a really basic water brush just got like the well this one could probably be replaced but <laughs> a little round point and I'll put the alcohol right in here in the winter time um and then a pencil and a gel pen and the one I use most often is the Uniball Signo Broad um and I have to write on them in sharpie that this is a new one because I go through these so quickly <laughs> that mm. the ink runs out um, but yeah, and then I'll, I'll bring loose leaves of paper and sometimes some other brushes if, uh, if I know it's a time when I'm going to paint, but for the most part, this is just what's in my bag, um, on a daily basis. I love that. Yeah. My pocket art toolkit is my daily carry too. And I'll carry my larger one when I'm like, okay, I know I'm going out, but, um, yeah. but no excuses. And <laughs> I should show you, exactly. you might appreciate this as a mom. I'll just pull up my camera a second. My the newest pen my daughter gave me has a cat on it that you. Oh, it. cute! <laughs> <laughs> my kit Love definitely it. gets filled with the the supplies for the family. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's it's nice that it can accommodate that. Um, <laughs> maybe one day there'll be a time when when I'll have it back to myself. But yeah, um, yeah. And sure. I feel like if folks haven't had a chance to see more of your work, you do a lot of really cool gel pen stuff of like layering the gel pen that I've personally been really inspired by yeah it's like middle school all over again for me <laughs> back when gel pens were the height of uh I don't know stationary um yeah I I just started experimenting with it and over 
overlaying um, gel pen at the end of my work um, and really liked some of the more expressive lines that it gave. And um, mostly I use white. Um, and I, I think I, I chose white initially because I paint so much snow in wintertime and it just felt more natural to me than using a black pen. And uh, I remember showing it to my dad and he's like, you could ease up on the gel pen. And now I feel like it's the question I get asked the most is <laughs> how to incorporate gel pen. So sorry, dad. <laughs> and you've had an exhibit with your dad too before, right? Yeah, he's he uh this summer we had well and actually our first ever art show. We uh, have been learning together over the years and he's an architect by training, so he has great great drawing skills and uh a lot to teach in that regard and we're both both working on incorporating the the watercolor and colored. I just pulled up your Instagram a minute. Oh, so yeah and get a little peek at some of your your gel pen work um oh yeah I love that that sharing art with family um, absolutely three generations over here wow wow all in Alaska yep yep um well let us know what we're gonna work on today with you so today I want to show you one of my favorite new exercises that I've been doing and whether you paint inside or outside, uh, I feel like it's really easy for me to be overwhelmed by a scene. Um, you know, if I'm even if I'm sitting in my backyard, which is a birch forest, and I want to do a quick sketch, and I look and I'm like, well, do I focus on one tree? Do I look it up and look at the you know canopy? Do I look straight ahead and focus on you know the trunks. There's so much uh, to interpret in each scene. And because I really think of art as a way of kind of being in conversation with the environment, um, I like, you know, considering multiple elements of one scene. And so <clears throat> I started, uh, I actually started this in a sketchbook, but then I started doing it on bigger sheets of paper as well, where I will take one scene and interpret it in four different ways on the same same page. And I'll show you an example of what that has looked like in some recent ones that I've done. Um, the Northern Lights or the Aurora Borealis are quite common up here. It might be cold, but at least we get some pretty views. And <clears throat> they're such an ephemeral phenomenon. They're hard to capture on camera for me. Um, and they can be really fun to paint, but you know, they're always moving, always dancing. And so I did this exercise where I taped off one sheet of paper and I just moved across the page with um, the different pigments to represent the Northern Lights and made sure that each scene kind of captured something different. Sometimes I'm looking up at them. Sometimes I'm looking out across, you know, a big open sky. Sometimes the trees are, are in the way um, or adding to the view, depending on your interpretation. But um, I, I tried to capture you know, the sort of many elements of a single landscape in one, one painting. And I'll give you one more example before we can begin our exercise here. And this is from this fall. I did a similar um, exercise from a local hill looking out and, you know, I have a 360 degree view. Again, I'm like, do I capture one you know, panorama in my sketchbook? Do I do the sketchbook vertical orientation or or horizontal? Um, and so I just taped off this page and did a little bit of everything, honing in on some spruce trees, some birch trees, you know, the big expansive horizon. Um, this is a little abstraction of a building down below, but all using the same, same colors and, um, you know, same tools to kind of give us some visual notes of a single place. Mm, those are, those are beautiful. And I am just seeing a couple of questions in the chat and we love questions and I'll do yeah. my best to get to them all. And um, Jill, as we get started, I, uh, someone's wondering if you've ever tried a refillable gel pen or found any. I haven't. 
Are, does that exist? Can you tell me more? <laughs> I, I don't. My one thought that I haven't yet played with is Detrimentus Ink. We've carried four of their colors right now. I believe has a white ink. And so oh, kind of yeah. like content filled with white ink is something that um, I should add to my list to play with. And perhaps if anyone else has experience with that and wants to pop that in the chat. Um, gosh, Jill, I love what you said there. Art is in conversation, art in conversation with the environment. That's really mm -hmm. beautiful. Uh, really that capturing some of that being in the field and reacting to what we see. And, um, but I see you've got one photo on your desk and we <laughs> have a photo in um, that image also um, linked in the description, our YouTube description. So if any of you joining right now want to see a large version of that, you can download it. Um, so how do we approach that with different perspectives? Yeah, so this is a, a very, Lovely picture that my husband took recently. Well, I guess it's been a few years now, but um, it's sort of very representative of this time of year for me um, with the fading skies and recent full moon um, and sort of the gentle, you know, rolling hills and mountains um, that are typical of interior Alaska. So this picture kind of feels like home to me and I wanted to share it with you guys. Um, and <clears throat> one thing... Here, a little tool I have to get started um, is I'll just cut out a piece of paper or cardboard. And in the field, you know, you can hold your hands up, make your little viewfinder, right? Like this, frame off different um, areas of interest and kind of hone in on, on things that uh, appeal to you. And so this is a it's a very personal process, right? Because we're all intrigued by different elements of of landscape, whether that's colors or shapes or line. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and identify four main areas of this that are of interest to me, and I'm going to I'll draw them out on Sharpie so you can follow along if you want to do the same. But also, if you have the reference image or if you're applying this exercise to other, you know, real life experiences or reference photos that you have. Um, definitely consider, you know, when you look at this, what, what calls to you, what, you know, little layers are of interest. Mm. Um, oh, I love the homemade viewfinder too, that you can yeah. just do a little cardboard. <laughs> I just happen to have, I'll pull myself up one more time. Um, one that I made recently where I did two L's. So then I could play with some different yeah. things and then, you know, you can tape it or something, but it, it's just, you know, four little pieces of paper that I can <laughs> absolutely yes. yeah I like that yours is adjustable that's thinking <laughs> because it's true you know they don't need to all be the same same size you can definitely zoom in or zoom out um but I'm going to start with all right with the thing that calls to me most hmm. probably this framing roughly centered um a little bit of the fading sky and we're going to draw all over the picture. It's fine. And I'm going to put a one next to that. So we got one. I'm going to go vertical orientation too, uh, or I guess like portrait instead of landscape. I feel like I do a lot of landscape. Is it named that for a reason, I guess, because panoramas are <laughs> lines and landscapes. Um, but I made an executive decision and here we are. <laughs> um, Next, I think I'm gonna, actually, okay, I'll say one more caveat for this exercise. I think that I I create well when I have a few parameters and I think it, I think it actually helps me be a little more free in my paintings. And often my main parameter is time. Uh, it's just a constraint that I have, you know, I can usually only paint for 15 minutes maximum and I get done what I can in that in that time frame. But I also think <clears throat> things like you know, the tools that you work with or um, the amount of space that you're trying to cover on a page, some of these parameters can also be really helpful and and give you more creativity and freedom in those, you know boundaries that you set. So. I agree. I like constraints. It's like you don't have as many decisions to make so that you exactly, can exactly, like yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so I'm going to go for another one here. I think I'm interested in this little mountain peak and the foreground um, 
or the middle ground with some interesting tree patterns. <clears throat> so I'll put a two here. And I guess in my mind, these would be the, the scenes that I was, I'd be most called to initially. But now I think I wanna, when I do these exercises and there's four and I know I have to make four paintings, my one rule is that they all have to be different compositions. So I can't repeat the same scene. And, um, and I like to try to do one that I wouldn't normally be called to. Um, just for the experimental aspect of it. This is sort of about about play, about trying new things. Um, and, you know, at the end, if you end up not loving all of them, then at least you know what you don't like. It's fine. <laughs> so I'm going to go maybe for these these layers of we've got like mountain rock in the back here and then sort of darker trees and then lighter trees in the front mm. just kind of maybe a little more abstract mm -hmm. um and it's another interesting point about you know being in a landscape and being in conversation with it is that there's so many elements there's the sky there's the ground that you might be standing on there's the foreground the middle ground the back all of it and there's so much to kind of observe um that this exercise can kind of help you think about these different areas both individually and as a as a collection hmm. oh that's wonderful and um i wonder too just a minor little sidetrack. We've gotten mm -hmm. some questions about your palette and the little white circles on your desk. And <laughs> after our demo, can you send us a list of all the colors we can add in the description? Yeah, sure. Awesome. I will tell you the um, colors that we'll be using today uh, in just a second. Let me choose. Let me choose a fourth scene here. I think. Oh, you're I gonna squeeze one more in. Oh yeah. <laughs> can you we're, overlap we're it. or? Um... <laughs> you I let think. Back to the moon. Uh huh. So you don't yeah. do the same one twice, but you can overlap. I can overlap. Yeah. Great. I'm making the rules. I can change them too, I guess. But <laughs> all right. There's our four. Um. So I'll show you the tools or the colors that we're going to use today because I think it mentioned in the advertisement here that this was going to be a limited palette. And as we talk about, um, you know, boundaries and constraints, this is a good one for me. So I've got, I'm gonna use three colors and they're all in these pans here, but I'll show them in the tube just so you can see better. But I've got uh, quinacridone rose for my, it's my favorite winter pink to use um, for sky, for snow. Um, if you live around snow, you know that it's rarely white. I did a color exercise um, a few years ago where I would just take notes of the colors at different times of day in the winter time and you know all shades of blues and pinks and pastels uh so this is quinacridone rose my favorite pink to use and I'll use that probably mostly for the sky here and then I'm going to use French ultramarine um which is my favorite to use for snow shadows and kind of like a rich just a rich blue. And finally, um, is it Indanthrone or do you know? That's one, yeah, that's one of my favorites. Yeah. My you can see my tube is almost gone. I'm gonna have to <laughs> restart. <laughs> but fortunately the pan is is full enough. Um, but Indanthrone blue, which is like a rich uh darker blue, and these both of the blues have a bit of a red shade to them. Um, and they mix well also with, with the rose and other like reddish pinkish shades, I think. Um, so those are the three colors that I'm going to use. And <clears throat> I also grabbed a oil pastel, um, because I guess the thing I didn't mention about my art toolkit is that in sharing supplies with my daughter, I've also been bringing along a lot more of, uh, things that I haven't used um, since my childhood with like 
watercolor pencils and oil pastels and things like that. And so I usually actually have a few of these on hand and um, think they can be fun to play with and experiment with and get a little like mixed media action going on. Um, and then I have a gel pen and a pencil and it's the same gel pen that I um, mentioned before. So that's that's the extent of it. Mm -hmm. this drawing or painting session. Um, and then I'll just say real quick that the paper I'm using um, is just a sheet of the Arches Cold Press um, 9 by 12. And I do really like this paper and I think that the quality of the paper um, that you use can affect your love of watercolor <laughs> because it can blend you know, more easily or more, I don't know, less smooth, depending on the paper. And so this is my favorite paper to use. I'll cut up sheets of this and um, keep keep it in my um, art toolkit or, um, or just work from full sheets as well. Because um, sometimes it's nice to have paper that, you know, you can, you don't, I don't, I never want to rip up a sketchbook, but sometimes I want to make work that I can, you know, send or share and cutting up smaller sheets of this is a nice way to do that for me. So mm -hmm. I'm just taping off this paper. Um, if you're a perfectionist and this bothers you that I'm not measuring, then I'm sorry. But I like to eyeball things and you also wouldn't have to tape off anything i've done this just by drawing bounding boxes in a, a sketchbook or on a sheet of paper but this is just sort of a clean way to do it um in a studio setting when you've got the time and the supplies to do so and i just use regular painter's tape um if anyone has great tape recommendations. <laughs> yeah. I haven't had any issues with this bleeding, but um, what, do you, what do you use, Maria? I like to use just like a little half inch uh, masking tape that's a little thinner usually. Mm -hmm. And um, I like to use a neutral color from, that's my preference. Sometimes yeah. the colors next to it um, sort of influence what I see. <laughs> totally, yeah. I'll say the blue, but if it's what you're used to and it works for you, go with it. But it's always helpful, I find, to test out the tape on your paper. And then if your tape's too sticky, my trick is to put it on like your jeans or like a shirt mm -hmm. so it's a little less tacky and then put it on your paper. Well, that is a good um, idea, yeah. And Jill, I don't know if you have a little extra scrap piece of paper as you go. Um, we've had a request if you might swatch out the, the colors so folks can see them. Sure, yeah. As you paint. Yes. Um, well, that brings me to the final sheet of uh, or a final thing that I didn't share, my my handy palette. I'm a big uh, proponent of using what you have <laughs> in all regards of uh, art because I think the best supplies are going to be the ones that you use and uh, don't treat too preciously. And so I this is just a cap from, um, I don't know, beer or kombucha four pack. <laughs> and it's one of my favorite palettes. I can bring it easily into the field, um, you know, throw it in a bag if I'm working on something bigger and um, uh, don't have to worry about breaking it. And yeah, I even use them at home too. Um, and I would, I normally in, in my field practice, I just mix my colors here, but I didn't clean it off for today. So that's fine. So I'll mix... I know where my colors are. Do you guys ever get mixed up with your colors in your palette when you have a lot of them? <laughs> I know I... Sometimes I do like making a little map of my palettes, but when yeah. I change them too often, but um, whenever I leave on a trip, usually like the first page of a sketchbook is like what's in my palette. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I guess... First, really quick, before I swatch these, um, I will put the, 
um, correlating numbers on here. And I'm just gonna do a really, really basic um, sketch just to kind of guide me. So I'm sure, you, yeah, the pencil is probably gonna be really hard to see and it's a little light, but I'll just go really quick. Just super simple lines, just kind of guiding my, um, where I'll put the color down. I sketch a little before I paint usually, but not a ton. Um, I kind of like to let the paint guide my work. Um, and sometimes I'll come in with lines afterward, but. So this is the French ultramarine and it's sort of in a middle, um, There's a bit darker pigment. I'm going to use a pretty watered down version of this, and I'm going to start with, with the French ultramarine for my snow. I usually work probably like most watercolor is um, from light to dark as much as I can. Um, and so I'm going to go in here because we know the snow is not white and just lay down a bit of this French ultramarine for my snow. I'm just kind of doing big wash, loose lines. And I'm using a, um, what is this, a 14? Yeah, 14 long round brush, um, which I like because it can hold quite a bit of water, but also has a nice point on it. So when we're doing things like trees, um, it can make some nice definition there. And my other, I guess, rule of this exercise is to paint all, use all, all one color at one, one time. Is that a good way to say it? Um, like I wanna paint, be simultaneously painting all four of these images um, at once. And I'm gonna get my blue down and then we'll move to the next, next color. Oh, I love that. I like to, in the field, you know, if you've got more than one thing going on at once or in the studio and you need a layer to dry, then you have something else to do. Absolutely. Yes. That's, yeah. So I'm going to start with all of them. Oops. That's okay. All right, so that's down. But we also know that this snow isn't exactly um, uniform in color. There's these spots of just kind of light, um, light clean snow. But down here for our number one, we have this foreground of darker um, trees, but I'm gonna just put in a little little texture and I actually really like ultramarine because it's a granulating um, pigment. And so it, um, you know, it's smooth, but it gives a little more texture and it almost is like kind of icy and wintry to me. And I really like that about it. And so I'm still, I'm learning a lot about paints uh, the more I paint, which is kind of how it goes, right? Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, I didn't a couple of years ago. I didn't even know that granulating or not granulating was a an option or a thing. But it's been fun to learn that about different pigments and then sort of make choices um, based on how you'd like it to look. Yeah, that's a quality I really love. So here, I'm just going to go in with like a little bit of texture for the rocks that are exposed here. And I will also go in with a little shadow for this bottom um, tree hill. And again, it's very loose, <clears throat> but I am thinking about um, you know, how things are in nature 
is often quite, sorry, painting and talking, okay. Um, quite loose and, you know, you can be really precise with things, but it also, I'm just trying to get the message across, not an exact, you know, replica or photo, so. All right, I think I'm happy with those. And now I'll mix my um, quinacridone rose, which is here, really dangerously close to the red. I'm gonna water it down a bit too. And I want to make enough that it should be pretty even across all, um, I guess it only is gonna be in three of these images, or these paintings. And I'm gonna need a little bit more of my blue. So I'll make some of that now while this is drying. So if the faded skies were your favorite part of this image or of winter in Alaska, then this should be your favorite part. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I'm gonna go in with just a clean brush. My water is a little purple tinted now, but I think it's clean enough. And I'm just gonna lay down some water before I do this blend. Just a light layer so that it's glossy. Um, and I'm not going to touch it to the snow yet since it's just it's still drying. But I'm going to go across the whole page on all of these where the sky is exposed. And just getting it lightly wet. I am going across the moon. Um, which if I were going to do the moon in watercolor, I would leave it white at this stage. But I think I'm going to go in with the um, oil pastel that I have and do that at the end. So no worries. So I just want to make it make sure it's smooth and not pooling anywhere. Um, and then I will like pick up my page and you can sort of see if there's like a little bit of a shine to it. And that's what I want. And it's still wet on all of them pretty evenly. So I'm going to start here and I'll show you this um, Quinn Rose real quick. <clears throat> a little darker. It's a pretty, pretty bold, vibrant color. It's my daughter's favorite color in this, in this kit. Um, but it's the uh, leave that there. And then I'm going right in. So this one is sort of pink at the top and then it fades to blue. So I'll get the pink down. And then this just has like a hint. And this number four has quite a bit. So we'll let it fade. And I always remind myself that when you pre-wet the page um, to get these kind of blends, that the color fades more than if you just put the, the pigment right onto dry paper. Um, and so it looks maybe a little bit strong um, at the moment, but I think it will fade 
nicely as it dries. Um, and, you know, it's always something to that I'm experimenting with is, is getting the right colors, getting fades that I feel are, you know, accurate, but also interesting. Um, so once I get the first color down, I could have started either way with, with blue or with um, the pink. But once I get it down, I'll go in the opposite direction or from, you know, from the other end of the gradient with the other color. Um, and I can bring this pretty close now. I'm actually going to get it just a teeny bit stronger so that it doesn't look exactly like the snow. And then I'll just start to fade it up. And I usually leave just a hint of white or like unpainted space between two colors when I'm fading them. And so I didn't blend, you know, this blue all the way into the, into the pink. Um, and as it dries, it'll continue to blend a little more together. And then I'll go in here. The working sequentially is really fun going across painting to painting. It is fun and it keeps you busy, you know. <laughs> These paintings don't take all day to make. Um, it's supposed to be supposed to be quick in case you're like me and you only have a few minutes. This one I did go into because um, I did blend all the way up since the pink is only just emerging here at the top. And then we'll do, making sure that one's still wet down here. We'll do our last fade. And we'll let those, those dry and then we can work on the other part. That's what's fun. Yeah, there's always, always something to chip away at here. So I'm gonna go back with my uh, ultramarine, mix a teeny bit more. And then um, at the same time, I'm gonna add my in Danthrone to the other palette and you can see what a nice and rich blue this is. Mm. Nice maybe. And then when you And this actually is a good example of the little bloom that occurred here. And uh, you can see the granulation in the French ultramarine here. Um, just that it doesn't, it doesn't dry uniform. It's almost like it has these little flecks of, I don't know, sand. <laughs> probably, I mean, it's probably the pigment, right? So I'll get my blues ready while these finish drying. I got a great question about how uh, saying my wet and wet never happens. How much, how do you know how much water to use for the first layer? Mm. I go by, yeah, I don't know. It's sort of hard to explain. I go by the shine um, that you can see, you know, if you're out, if you're holding it up to light and you can see that it's, uh, you know, reflecting a little bit of light but also that it isn't pooling. So, you know, if you tilted your paper, that water isn't gonna be dripping or pooling in any area. Um, 
and I let it sit for a moment and absorb into the page. But a moment's not a clear definition of time. I mean, maybe like 30 seconds to a minute before I would begin applying any color just so that the page has a little bit of time to, to absorb it and even out. But do you have a more uh, nuanced answer than that? <laughs> no, I think your answer is great. I just similarly playing with like shiny so that, but no puddles. And when yeah. it gets a little matte, that's when you don't want to touch it. Yeah. And yeah. My paper is looking about right now. And then my other trick is to also test dryness. I turn over my hand so the back of my hand can feel for any evaporative cooling. Mm -hmm. um, it just means it's still drying. So hope that's helpful. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's definitely not something that like I got right on the first try. <laughs> um, <laughs> It's, it's taken and, or that I get right every single time, you know, sometimes I get impatient and just do too much too soon. And, um, it doesn't blend well or not let it, you know, like once at this stage, I, I wouldn't touch them. Um, and I've made that, I guess I've made that mistake before where I've, I've ruined the, uh, smoothness of it by, by being kind of finicky. That's how you learn. You experiment. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm just going in with the French ultramarine and like defining a little bit more um, shadow and, and texture. Like this one that I'm on here, number three, this sort of rocky uh, texture that I'm being pretty abstract with, but just want to get a little bit of color down. And I notice you're not dipping your, it looks like you're drying your brush. You're working with a fairly dry brush versus a yeah. wet control. Yep. Um, and because this is mostly these are mostly dry, so I'm not expecting a lot of um, bleeding or blending at this stage. And I want, yeah, there to be a little bit of definition in these shapes. Um, you know, rocks are kind of geometric in in nature, so it's sort of nice to get some some edges and little shapes developing there. Um, and I feel fine about this. Might add a few. This section has a lot of like fallen and downed trees. So up here where it's a little wet, it'll be a little blurred, but I'm gonna get some like just tree shapes in here. And then what do we have in number one? I like this and I'm just gonna go in with the darker blue. <clears throat> so we have this, I'm going to be painting this little hill in the foreground, giving some spruce shapes to it. And that's one of my favorite ways to paint trees is with kind of a wet brush like this, where you're just giving the giving the suggestion of a forest, but not um, having to draw each tree individually. We'll get a little bit more. And then here, <clears throat> we have, it's a little wet, so I'll, I'll move to number three, <clears throat> which similar technique here. I'm okay with that blending just a little in the wet, kind of gives a nice, tree appearance.
And I like this because you can kind of spend as long or as little as you like um, working on these. You know, if you're doing it as a quick exercise to kind of get a feel for a landscape and the colors, then, um, you know, this could be almost, almost finished. Um, and if you wanted to spend another hour, you know, working on details, you could do that too. Sorry, my dog is uh, oh, just, okay. just dying to go out in these cold weather. That's always the juggle is time versus um, sort of detail of how much to simplify. And Fortunately, I have a husky who is uh, well equipped for cold days like today and would rather be outside than inside. <laughs> um, this one. Doesn't need any dark, I don't think. And then here, now that this is a little more dry, I'm going to add some of these trees down the midline. I actually like how it's blending in a little bit with these. I love how your choice of colors really forces you to simplify too. And yeah, I mean, I actually have painted this scene before with the uh, more, well, I guess unlimited options and colors aiming for more um, accuracy and um, I really kind of like how this captures, you know, the spirit of it um, without worrying too much about, you know, mixing exact, exact shades. That can be a puzzle for a, a lot of folks in sort of letting go of trying to be exactly painting exactly what's in front of us, mm -hmm. but sort of evoking mood and the limited palette seems like a really nice tool for that to play with what you have. Yeah, I think I think it definitely does. And then just a couple of these little trees, suggestions of them down here. I like this one. It's really about about textures. When I have done these in the past, I, I usually try both in composition to be choosing something that I normally maybe wouldn't gravitate towards, but also um, I mentioned with, with tools to be trying something new. And I know we all have a few art supplies that we, you know, <clears throat> haven't used in a long time or haven't tried out yet or waiting for the perfect moment. And so by incorporating kind of just one thing at a time here, um, I I feel like it's it's dipping my toe into into mixed media or, or trying new um, materials and so I'm gonna go in now with this uh, what color is it pale orange oil pastel for the moon and see how that um, works. Oh, fun. Yeah, that's kind of nice. And down here in our other moon. And these are all dry. They're a little cold to the touch, which I wouldn't paint on it at this stage um, if I didn't want it to blend, but they are definitely fine for this. Oh, Jill, these have really come together so quickly, all four. Yeah, they're sort of in, uh, you know, communication with each other based on the on the palette and then um, just sort of some repetitive strokes, but um, all have their own sort of little focus or story with them. Um, 
Yeah. And I'm guessing you need to wait till they're totally dry to take off the tape, which is always no, no, like, no. I'm not. Oh, I'm you're going to do it for us? Oh, yeah. That's the best part, right? That's, I wouldn't have oh, used the tape if I wasn't going to peel it. <laughs> oh, it's so satisfying. I know. Um, and it's, it's fun to look over and think, you know, which which of these resonated with you as an individual composition you know, if I first gravitated towards this scene, am I still, you know, convinced that this is my favorite? I mean, I kind of like this. Uh, it's like it's roll the moon's rolling down the mountainside here. Um, but <clears throat> yeah, I mean, at the at the end of the day, what you have is either, you know, just the exercise in itself. Or, you know, maybe you have four Valentines or postcards if you cut these up and wanted to send them off. Um, maybe it's a thumbnail for a future sketch uh, that you'd like to expand on or give more detail to, but it's sort of a nice, nice experiment. Um, hmm. Can you hold them up a little bit closer to your camera? Yeah, of course. Oh, and I love your moon really glows and it, it really is a similar color to your photo, that sort of creamy. Yeah, this was the you know, set I've had since I was 12. And I was like, I need a, I need a new, a new tool to use. Like, am I going to grab a colored pencil or a pastel? Oh. But, um, and then I would, you know, once this was fully dry, I'd probably go in with my gel pen um, and maybe just define the trees a little bit more, just do some dash, you know, marks. Mm -hmm. Even, you know, you could just give a little, Oh, is this the new one? Yeah. It's... Sometimes you got to get these going. Yeah. Oh, add like a little glow along that horizon. Oh. Yeah. Um, well, and then this is, you know, there, this is where you can sort of just. Mm. I might even like do a little snow angle. Um, yeah. Some trees. Definition. Uh huh. But. Yeah, you can play with them as much or as little as you like and um, hopefully have a good time with it. Oh, Jill, that's terrifically inspiring. And and can you share with us how to stay connected with you and what's going on in your art world that we can follow? And <laughs> Yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, you can find me on Instagram, Jill Ritchie Art, or my website, jillrichieart.com. Um, <clears throat> I send out newsletters with, you know, updates about upcoming work and projects that I've got going on, um, pretty much pretty monthly, um, and, and pretty active on social media as well. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of taking this as a slow start to a new year, uh, kept my calendar clear after having a baby the last summer, um, and I'm just dipping my toe back into it, but I really appreciate the chance to, to teach or, or do a live demo with you guys. It's my first time doing something like this. So um, oh, I'm excited to <laughs> have started that. Um, and yeah, have, have some paintings and works. And mostly my goal is just to continue creating um, and finding ways to work that into my current life with, with work and kids and all that. So oh. 10 minutes at a time, it, it can definitely be done. Oh, well, really inspiring. I've got my little page here. I'll, I'll finish up. I've enjoyed following along with oh, you and I hope um, everyone else has too. And um, Jill, I just want to thank you all and thank everyone for joining us. And I just love your emphasis on attention and um, I think your playfulness of just approaching things and staying lighthearted around it where um, it doesn't have to be precious, but coming together is such a, a beautiful series. So Thank you so much and hope you all have a um, wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, Maria. Bye, everybody. Bye. Yay. Oh, there was one last question I'll post here.